Here's a little bit more of an abstract example of stereoisomers that I um, made using Google SketchUp. Actually, a really cool program, if I can throw a little plug in there. But you can think about stereoisomers really in terms of just boxes, right? So these boxes we can imagine as connected to each other. Think of them as very basic molecules in and of themselves. And what we'll notice is that every box is connected to the same boxes in the sense that blue is connected to gray, it's connected to gray, red, and white. The connectivity of these two sets of boxes is identical. But what's different is, for instance, the interbox distance, if you will, between the white box and the blue box. We see here that the white and the blue box are much closer together, whereas here they're much farther away. And again, to the extent that that distance influences the behavior of a molecule or a set of boxes, you know, depending on what they do, those two structures are distinctly different. You know, if, if we wanted to use, for instance, um, the one of these structures as a model, I don't know, to as a bookcase or something, we wouldn't want to use this one with the sort of zigzag structure because then if we put our books in, you know, over on this side, they would all just fall right over, right? We'd want something that could actually hold the books in. So that just gives you sort of an abstract idea of the difference between stereoisomers. Same connectivity, but different shape. All right, so I want to hit in this last 12 minutes or so on some examples of stereoisomerism. So the first example I'll show you is the example of tetrahedral carbon. So let's take a compound that looks like this. and think about the possible stereoisomers here. So remember there are two positions essentially we could place the OH or hydroxyl groups. We could place them coming out at us or going away from us. If we place them both coming out at us, that's one compound. But now if we place one coming out and one going back, then we've actually generated a stereoisomer of the first compound. These two molecules are not superimposable no matter how hard you try. So for instance, if you were to swing out the OH group in order to try to align it with the OH group here, then you would have the methyl group going back. So in other words, if I, if I were to make everything match up as much as possible, from the other molecule, we could get everything to line up if we swung that hydroxyl group around except for the methyl group. The methyl group would end up going back away from us. And I would invite you to, to try this out. You know, Build a model if you have a model kit and see if you can superimpose these two molecules and I bet you can't. To see that in three dimensions, I wanted to jump off really quick and show you some JMOL images of these compounds drawn in a slightly different view. So if I turn this sideways, you can see the zigzag structure, and we see this is the isomer with the two hydroxyls coming out towards us. I'm going to rotate that 90 degrees or so and get that like that. Here, if I rotate this one, you can see this is the one where we have one going back and one coming out. I'm going to rotate that now back so that we've got that zigzag sort of perpendicular to us. What you can see here is that these cannot be superimposed. So notice that on these two structures, everything essentially matches up except for the bottom hydroxyl. So on the bottom hydroxyl group is pointing to the right on this right-hand structure. It's pointing to the left on this left-hand structure. And so those molecules are not superimposable. They're stereoisomers. They have the same connectivity, right? Carbon is connected to carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, carbon, etc. What they differ in is the shape of the molecules, and that's sort of the key here. Double bond stereoisomerism is actually a very interesting example. So if you take a, a double bond, and re remember, you should recall that double bonds are trigonal planar. So double bonds are planar. The two carbons of a double bond are sp2 hybridized. If we throw a substituent on one of 
the carbons of a double bond and we throw a different substituent on the other side, say it's an H, so the other substituent on that side of the double bond, then the two positions on the other carbon are inequivalent stereochemically or spatially. So one position is closer to the methyl group, the other position is farther away. So if we were to take the same substituent and place it in one position or the other, we would generate stereoisomers, right? Because the distance and the key sort of metric you can think about is that methyl distance. It's much shorter for what's called the cis isomer. This is called the cis isomer. And it's much longer for the trans isomer, in which we take that methyl group and place it far away from the original methyl group. So double bond stereoisomerism is something we'll hit again when we talk about nomenclature, but a very important uh, aspect of stereochemistry in and of itself. And you'll see cis and trans isomers have very different behavior. Um, they're somewhat hard to separate, but we can, in theory, separate them based on this difference in properties afforded by their different stereochemistry. Conformational stereoisomers we talked about before with that example of butane. Um, another example I'll, I'll give you to think about is the example of chair cyclohexane, which will hit hard in the next chapter, but these two cyclohexane chairs are actually conformational isomers, but they're actually also, actually let, let me throw a substituent on there just to really hit the point home. Let's just call it R. These two are stereoisomers. They're not superimposable, but they're also interconvertible by conformational changes. So those are conformational stereoisomers, just like we saw with the two kinds of butane a little bit earlier. Cycloalkane stereoisomers show up all over the place. So cycloalkanes sort of define, here's a six-membered uh, cyclohexane ring. The plane above and below the cyclohexane ring are two stereochemically different environments. So if we place two substituents, say, on adjacent atoms, like so, say R1 and R2 here, and then we imagine placing the substituents one up, or say R1 up and R2 down, just as we saw for the diol case, the dihydroxyl case a little bit earlier, these two are actually diastereomers. They're not superimposable on one another. And they have all the same connectivity, again, but, uh, but they're not superimposable on one another, and thus they have different properties.